I have a question concerning that particular verse. Uh, did that verse means literally or metaf- metaf- uh, no, it means literally. used as a metaphor? No, it means literally. He, he, so, uh, all cried Jonah out. is describing what happened to him. That yeah. is descriptive of what Jonah experienced. And it's, so, it's, so, the, con- the, the context of this, how we actually have it in our text, is that okay. when Jonah is delivered from this after his adventure in Nineveh, this is what most people do after they've had an encounter with God. What they do is that they go back to Jerusalem, they offer up a sacrifice, and while that sacrifice is burning, they sing or tell the people what happened, which is the cause of said sacrifice. So he is describing his experience that he felt, that his soul felt while he was in the belly of the whale, that he was dead, as it says, the waters encompass me. They sought to take my life. The bars of the, of, of the place where I cannot escape closed around me, and the Lord delivered my life from the pit. He literally says, he saved me from death. He brought me back to life. So literally, it just means uh, Jonah was in the when he was in the belly of uh, a well, he died, and then God brought him back to life. Yes, Here, I'll, literally... I'll tell you even further. Yes. So scientifically speaking, the whale's um, stomach acid is extremely like solvent. Toxic. It will yeah. it will actually dissolve you whole. So. There's no way, and you would see atheists making this argument that, oh, how could someone, you know, stay in the stomach uh, alive? We can appeal to the miraculous uh, act of God, but even if he was dissolved, God has resurrected him and brought him back to life. So we, the, the issue here, regardless how you look at it, it's not possible to stay completely alive unless miraculously sustained. So if, if Jonah was alive, then he would have sust- substantiated that in a different verbiage. He would have said, God have kept me alive in the stomach of the whale. Now that is an accurate description, but he obviously have experienced death and that's why he's using that verbiage. Do you see the two different ways? If he was alive, he would have described his preservation in in, in a place that's inhab. Sorry, I can't even speak. Inhabitable, not not uh, ha- habitable for any human being or any living thing. But instead, he admits he was in a place where the dead was um, habited. <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't speak. Yeah, where the dead where the dead go. Right. Uh, okay. So, I, I don't. I don't. I don't know about uh, the Christianity idea of uh, a person. Where does a person go after death? So, uh, regularly, you, I just you can see to the to the narration though. The narration has to make an actual uh, dichotomy. It's either been preserved or experienced death. If if he was preserved, this is not the language that Jonah. Has... Yeah, yeah, I understood you. I understood okay. you. It's just uh, uh, I was asking, for example, there was this uh, one person who Jesus uh, resurrected from uh, dead. I, I, I don't remember his name because I really don't read oh, the Bible. Right. Yeah, there is this uh, one guy who uh, died and Jesus uh, resurrected him. Yeah, uh, Lazarus. So, uh, Lazarus, yeah. So uh, if also uh, this Jonah uh, went through the same uh, issue that he died and then God resurrected him. So um, I read in, in our religion that uh, whenever a person dies, they never come back, right? Like you don't know where you are going because, uh, okay, I don't want to go to that. But the thing is that I, 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 read, I, I really wanted to understand about that is uh, these people who uh, went through this death experience, when they come back to life, why do don't we have any narration of where they were when they uh, they were dead? They do. Like they, where did where like, did they go and what Jonah, they will experience with that? Yes. Well, they do. Jonah calls it Sheol, the realm of the dead. 
And Jesus actually describes something similar to that. He says that, you know, the place of the dead has two compartments, one of blessedness and one of torment. And so it, it describes that. It, Jesus describes the afterlife. But, but the point of that is, is, is not to be discussed here. The point is, is that your friend went to Jonah to say that since Jonah was, quote unquote, alive, in the belly of the whale, then Jesus, when he's in the heart of the earth after his crucifixion, would still be alive. But as we just pointed out, that's not the case. Jonah was not alive. So if Jonah was not alive in the whale, then Jesus died at his crucifixion. Right, Sully? Yeah, yes, cool. according to his comparison, yeah. Cool. So, so do you not see hear from Jesus's own words that Jesus prophesies his own crucifixion and resurrection, right? Well, not only his crucifixion, but his death, his burial, and his resurrection, right? Yeah, right. I'm, I'm not really deep into the Bible, so... Uh... Yeah, so, but, but here, here we have the words of Jesus, and as you just saw, Jesus prophesies his own death, burial, and resurrection. But the Quran disagrees with that, right? Yeah, right. So who are we going to trust? Are we going to trust the words of Jesus? Because he says that not only am I prophesying this in Luke 24 and in multiple other passages, for example, in John 5, he says that the prophets before him have foretold this. So Jesus says that this event is not only prophesied by him, but all of the prophets before him. So who should we believe? Should we believe in Jesus and the prophets? Or should we believe Muhammad? According to, um, according to uh, the idea of mercy transmission, you have to believe Jesus and other prophets. Right. So, which also, according to us Muslims, uh, we do have um, this uh, one pillar of our religion that whosoever does not believe in Jesus Christ is not a Muslim. No Muslim is a Muslim if he doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. But this kind of uh, beliefs between Christianity and uh, Islam, uh, uh, Islamic uh, perception of Jesus, they differ. But we, right. we, 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 we both think we believe in, G in Jesus. Right. So, so, who de so who determines what truly, who truly believes in Jesus? Those who believe what Jesus says or those who reject what Jesus says? I think those who believe what Jesus said. Very good. So, so here we see Jesus, along with the other prophets, say that he was crucified and that he rose from the dead. And so Jesus says, if you're going to believe me, you're going to have to believe what I say about myself. And he says that he's the son of God who died for your sins and rose on the third day. But Muhammad says that Jesus is not the son of God and did not die for our sins and did not rise on the third day. So again, who are we, who are we supposed to, if, if you, we really believe in Jesus, yes. if we really believe in Jesus, then we should believe what he said, that he's the son of God and that he died for our sins. Right? Very right. Yep. Then in that case, my friend, you need to reject Muhammad and leave Islam because Muhammad, as we just saw, disagrees with Jesus. So does Muhammad believe in Jesus? According as I'll answer that according to uh, Islamic uh, scriptures, yes, Muhammad believe in, 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 in Jesus. But, but and, according uh, to what but according to what Jesus himself said, does does Muhammad believe in Jesus? According to Jesus's own words about himself? So that, 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 I think that's why the contradiction comes between uh, which are exactly words of Jesus in Islam and which are exactly words of Jesus in the, uh, in the Bible. I well, think that's, that's where the, the, the contradiction is. Well, let, so, me, um, let me help you. Let me, let me help you. Because 
in order for you to know anything about the Islamic view of Jesus, you need to borrow from our Bible. In order for you to know anything about Jesus, you need to get it from our Bible. Let me, let me, let me explain. Um, for example, what language did Jesus speak? Uh, according to how I know, according to my uh, little limited knowledge, I, I think Jesus was uh, speaking types of Aramaic languages. Right. He spoke Aramaic, but does the Quran tell you that? Yeah, I think I, I, I'm not sure about that. I'll I am you. not really sure about that. I'll help you. Uh -uh. It, it doesn't tell you that. The New Testament yeah. does. In fact, it tells you that Jesus spoke three languages, Arabic, Hebrew, and Greek. Number two, does the Quran tell you where Jesus lived? In terms of narration, like where did Jesus live? Uh-huh. Nah, nah, no. I don't, I don't, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe so, yeah. Yeah, I'll help you. The New Testament tells us that Jesus was born in Bethlehem and lived in a town called Nazareth. This is why he's called Jesus of Nazareth. So the, the Quran doesn't tell you that, but the yes. New Testament does. Now, let me ask you this question, because I think this is really important. Does the Quran tell you how Jesus prayed, how Jesus worshipped? Yeah, that's that's when I believe he is. Uh... So where, so where does the Quran tell us how Jesus prayed? Uh, how prayed? I'm not sure, but um, I think it is Surat. Um, I'm not really sure if it was about praying or about his belief in, uh, in God. I think Surat, Surat uh, uh, chapter 66. I'm not sure of the name. That's, uh, there is a verse that says, uh, uh, I'm looking, I'm looking to it, but uh, it's not that Taharim. There is a the verse in the Quran that uh, says, um, وَقَالَ عِيْسَ بِنُ مَرْيَمْ يَا بَنِ إِزْرَائِيلِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ مُصَدِّكَ مِمَا إِنَّ بَيْنَا uh, yeah, he, he well, I, well, well, I, I don't I don't remember the, the, the narration very well. Uh, it's he's concerned. it's Jesus saying, well it says that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of Mary, who comes confirming the Torah between his hands, but it doesn't tell you how he prayed. The Quran never tells you how Jesus prayed or how Jesus worshipped. In fact, yeah, I, you would need I to think I think so, yeah. Mm. And, in fact, you would need to get that from the New Testament. And the New Testament tells us that Jesus prayed in a multitude of ways. Sometimes he put his head to the ground when he prayed. Sometimes yes. he stood lifting up his eyes to heaven. So, and lifting up your eyes to heaven when you pray, according to Muhammad, is haram. In lifting, fact, lifting, lifting up your eyes? lifting up your eyes to heaven when you pray. In fact, Muhammad says that if you do that, Allah will blind you. So, oh, so maybe that, that's, that's his when during the Salah, but you can make dua while you are raising your hands and raising your eyes to, to the heaven. But Salah... But when, when, you are, when you are performing uh, these uh, five so mandatory like, Salah, right. you, you are not supposed to do that, yeah? Right. So Jesus is doing prayer, Salat, and he lifts up his eyes to heaven. And so the Quran says, well, Muhammad says you can't do that. So, so Jesus. Uh, actually, we do that. Uh, actually, we do that. You, you can do that. Actually, you are allowed to do that in Islam. But uh, the word you use, uh, the word Salah means uh, Dua. So yeah, there so are there are there are there's a, there are those moments like those uh, five mandatory prayers for every Muslim, you cannot do that. But so anytime so outside of that, anytime outside of that, while well, you are making your duas, you can raise your hands and you can even raise your eyes up to heaven. That's, that's, that is truly acceptable. The only moment which is not acceptable is during those five mandatory prayers. What does dua mean? Supplication. Dua, hmm? dua is supplication. Cool. 
So in both times, because Jesus makes no distinction between the two, it's all prayer. Yeah, so I just explained. Uh, I just explained from the uh, perspective of Islam, oh, which that's, that's and under uh, under that's, which that's, circumstances cool. this is allowed, and cool. under which circumstance we this is not allowed. Cool. But what I'm saying is the the whole point of us going through this is you don't know that from the Quran. You have to rely on our New Testament. So the brass tax things that you would need to know about Jesus comes from the New Testament. For example, how does how does Jesus not not only how does Jesus pray, but what does Jesus say when he prays? What does Jesus call God? Well, well that's a question. Yeah. How does Je what does Jesus call God? According to Quran. Well, just according to history. According to history, I'm not a good historian, but I believe uh, he called God. Uh, so if Jesus spoke Aramaic, then he would call God in those uh, God in Aramaic. And he would particularly as we see from the New Testament, which tells us that Jesus spoke Aramaic from the same source, we see that he called him Abba, Father. Allah. Yes. Not Allah, Not Abba. Abba. Abba, Father. Does, does Muhammad agree that God is Abba? That God is Father? Okay, I don't know the meaning of that word uh, in 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 it, Arabic. It means father. Or... It means father. It, it, it would be Ab hmm. in Arabic. Ab, Ab, Ab in Arabic, if you know father in Arabic. Yeah. So so is Allah father, particularly the father of Jesus. Yeah. So uh, mind you all the answers i will answer them according to islamic but not according to Chris, uh christianic perceptions yeah so, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just i'm just asking according to muhammad because this okay. is a this is a this is a comparison to what jesus said to what muhammad claimed right we're, we're comparing what jesus said to what muhammad said right so right yeah. to, so jesus says that god is his father does Muhammad agree with Jesus or does he disagree with Jesus? Uh, so if he means father as a literary a father, no, uh, Prophet Muhammad does not agree with that. And it is not actually Prophet Muhammad. It is Allah himself who doesn't agree with that. Is but he, is, in is, Islam... Is, hold on, hold on, hold on, Sully. Is he metaphorically or rhetorically? Is, is Allah a father? in any sense of the term um meta metaphorically yes but not literally could you could you show me anywhere in your islamic sources that says that you can call allah father in a metaphorical sense because i think no, you just no, committed it, shirk it does it doesn't it doesn't uh in the quran there is nowhere uh, where allah demonstrate that he he is father or should be called father in the hadith in the hadith i'm not sure but i don't there is I'll, no way I'll, I'll, uh, I'll help you no there is there is nowhere in islamic theology where you could call allah father in any sense in fact muhammad would call that innovation bidda so Jesus says that God is his father in some sense, but Muhammad disagrees with that. But Muhammad claimed to be in complete agreement with Jesus, right? Yes, right. So we just saw that Muhammad claims to agree with Jesus, but then when we actually compared him to what Jesus himself said, he disagrees, right? 
Very right, yes. And we just agreed that Jesus says, whoever disagrees with me and what I say about myself does not actually believe in me, right? Very right. So I'll ask the question. According to Jesus, does Muhammad believe in him? No, according to the according to the New Testament, no, no. Right. Muhammad does not believe in Jesus. Right. So Jesus and the prophets are all on one accord, and the only one who disagrees is Muhammad. So who should we trust? Muhammad so, uh, or Jesus and the prophets? I answered that question already. It's Jesus and the prophets, but the, my my oh. my argument uh, my argument there will be um, where uh, uh, this uh, the angel from the Bible. I mean the New Testament. I mean the angel of uh, Luke, Mark, Matthew, and and, and John. Right. That so, is. Uh, that is yeah, the so New Testament. The, the New Testament. Yes. So my question or oh my 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 um my only concern here is mm -hmm. uh what is our point of reference on these scriptures I mean on these uh gospels or according to Mark Luke uh, Matthew and John that they were legitimate the words of Jesus that that's where my my reliance will be well, so to me for you to um well, let me let me, to, let me tell you Okay, so let, let me finish. Let me finish. So for, for, for me to be able to to be in a position like to understand, okay, so this is what truly Jesus said. I need to know if this was the original scriptures because us Muslims believe the gospel uh, was uh, revealed to Jesus, but there was no single gospel that was written by Jesus himself, but was written by Mark, Luke, Matthew and John. So how sure am I going to believe these were Jesus' words? That's, that's, that's my, my, my number one point. Well, there are two ways we can know. One, textually, and two, by chain. Number one, textually. We had already agreed a little bit earlier, and you, you and I agreed that the Torah and Injil before Muhammad was not corrupted. We had already agreed there. So when we look all the way before Muhammad, in the sixth century, fifth century, fourth, third, second, and first, the only documents that we have that are gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So textually, that's what we have, and that's what's always been there. And when we actually look at the, uh, at, at the chain, we're going to find that our apostolic authority goes all the way back for these gospels to the apostles. Let me ask you this question. Have you heard of something called apostolic succession? What? Have you heard of something called apostolic succession? Apostolic succession, no. Yeah, so this is the way that we can know that the books that we have in our hands goes all the way back to the apostles not merely because of textual criticism just looking at the text itself but looking at the chain of command the chain of authority you have something similar to that called it's not chains for your hadith exactly for yes. us, it's not just i heard it from this guy who heard it from this guy who heard it from this guy we have actual tactile hand-on-head authority from our leaders and their predecessors all the way back to the apostles. Let me give you an example and let me show you, let me, let me give you a source that explains what I'm talking about. So what I'm gonna to read to you is a book called Irenaeus, it's a man named Irenaeus. He's writing in the second century, third century, no, second century, correct. And he's writing a book called Against Heresies. And what he's doing is he's showing the origin of the gospel, the origin of the four gospels, and how they come down to us. So this is what he says in book three. We have learned from none others 
the plan of our salvation than from those from wh through whom the gospel has come down to us, which they did at one time proclaim in public and at a later period by the will of God handed down to us in the scriptures to be the ground and pillar of our faith. For after our Lord rose from the dead, the apostles were invested with power from on high. When the Holy Spirit came down upon them, they were filled with all his gifts and had perfect knowledge and departed to the ends of the earth, preaching the glad tidings of the good things from God to us and in equally and individually possess the gospel of God. Matthew issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect while Peter and Paul were preaching at Rome, laying the foundations of the church there. After their departure, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, did also hand down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. Luke also, the companion of Paul, recorded in a book the gospel preached by him. Afterwards, John, the disciple of the Lord, who had leaned upon his chest, did himself publish a gospel during his residence at Ephesus in Asia. So he tells us where the gospels come from, who wrote it, when they wrote it, and why they wrote it. And then we get the question of how do we know this? How do we, how do we know that the gospels come down to us? How do we know that this is true? He says in chapter three, it is within the power, therefore, in every church, including you, Sully, who may wish to see the truth, to contemplate clearly the tradition of the apostles manifested throughout the whole world. And we are in a position to reckon up those who were by the apostles instituted bishops in the churches and to demonstrate the succession of these men to our own times. Those who neither taught nor knew anything like what the heretics rave about. For if the apostles had, had known hidden mysteries which they were in the habit of imparting to people, they would have delivered them specifically to those whom they were committing to the churches themselves. For they were desirous that these men should be very perfect and blameless in all things, whom also they were believing, they were leaving behind as their successors, delivering up their own place of government to these men, which men, if they discharged their functions honestly, would be a great boon to the church. So here he says that the disciples, after writing these books, gave their books and their authority to these bishops. And we can trace these bishops down to our time, down to our time. I am an Anglican. I am under the authority of a bishop. Alex Farmer, specifically. And Alex can trace his lineage, his apostolic succession, back to Peter and Paul in Rome. The reason we know that we can trust our New Testament is because textually, that's the only text that we have in the first century onwards to us now. And we can literally go person to person Backing them, backing this story up, backing these, this story of Christianity back up to the very apostles themselves, who handed down their books and their authority down to us. That's how we know that we can trust the New Testament. That's how we can trust that what we have in the four Gospels are the very words of Jesus. Because Jesus said, whoever hears you, the apostles and those whom they appoint as successors, hears me. And if they hear me, they hear the one who sent me. Let me just that for two seconds there. Right. Uh, but then watch this, Sully. And to, to complete what Black Doctor just said, Ibn Ishaq, in the book uh, where it's um, the life of Muhammad, he confirms what black doctor is saying he confirms the 12 disciples he confirms that they were sent to different parts he confirms john wrote john he confirms the bible that what we have today and he was the earliest biographer of muhammad 
And I can hear that you're an honest guy, Sally, I'll give you that. And I'm asking you this from the bottom of my heart. Based on what we've presented to you today, I would love it if you actually took a time out, went back to the Injil that we have today, the book that we call the Bible today, the New Testament, and read why we decided that, that it's the truth. Because when you read it, you will see that it is truth. Right. So I will ask you this one thing for me, my man. If you just read the book of John, read five chapters in the book of John, come back and tell me that you don't see exactly what Black Doctor pointed out to you. That Jesus is no mere man. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a warner. He's not just a messiah. He is God in the flesh. And it's in front of you, but you refuse to acknowledge it, my man. Wait, here, do you, do you mind if I read him two passages? Because I think this really clinches it. Because since we've, since we've established the authority that we can trust the words of Jesus in the New Testament, let's hear again what Jesus and his disciples said about him. So do you, do you mind if I read these words from Jesus to you? No, no, I don't mind. You can proceed. Yeah, let's, let's look at the words of Jesus. So Jesus is speaking to his disciples after the resurrection in Luke 24. Luke 24. And he says this, beginning at verse 44. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of the prophets, in the law of Moses, and the prophets in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened up their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, in this way it is written that the Christ should suffer and after three days rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. That's one. So he says that the prophets foretold that I would suffer and die and I would rise from the third day and repentance of sins would be proclaimed in my name to all the ends of the earth. If you believe in me, you will be saved. Your sins will be forgiven. I have one other passage to go to you. You still there, Sully? Because I, I know this, this might be a lot, but there's one other, there's like one or two other passages I want to give you. This is, this is John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Yes. The first passage we looked at was Luke chapter 24. Yeah, I've noted that down. So this is John chapter 20. 20. Uh, starting from verse... Yeah, this is starting from verse um, 19. 19, okay, yeah. up to? Uh, this is going to be, actually, no, start at verse 24. 24. Start at verse 24 and go down to verse 29. 29, okay. Yeah, you can so, proceed. Mm -hmm. Now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came, when Jesus first came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. So they're already calling him Rab, Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and I place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand in his side, I will never believe. So there, Thomas is saying that I know you guys are saying that Jesus rose from the dead, but unless I see the marks of the crucifixion himself, themselves, and I touch him himself, I'll never believe you. I'll never believe you. But then he goes on to say in verse 26, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, 
Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So Jesus affirms to Thomas not only that he has risen from the dead by showing him literally the wounds of his crucifixion, but he affirms what Thomas has said, that he is Lord and that he is God. And he says, blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed that. Sully, Jesus offers up that blessing to you. If you believe that Jesus is Lord and God and that he died for your sins, your sins will be forgiven and you will receive Jesus's blessing. This is what Jesus himself said. I'm going to ask you this one question, Sully. Okay. Do you believe what he said? Yeah, I am a believer. Very, very good one. Do you believe? Um, do you believe yeah. that Jesus, what Jesus said, is true? I do believe what Jesus uh, said is true. Uh, but on my on my own end, I need to. Uh, I've quoted these verses. I have uh, written them down. I've yeah. gone through some of them. So yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 will, I, will, I just I'll walk through them. Brother. I'll walk through them uh, on my time. But here is my uh, another very very important question. My last one. This may be my last question. Sure. Um, so I'm not sure if this is exactly what it is, but uh, there is a. Uh, something we call uh, uh, the unchanged nature of God. So what is a real contra uh, contradiction on my end is the mm -hmm. idea of um, the idea of oneness of God, right? So prior to the resurrection, uh, prior for, uh, for the reincarnation of Jesus, all the prophets who came before him they were all addressed addressing to uh to god as one god as like there there was a consistent nature of god from the time of uh adam to time uh before jesus i believe it was the time of uh john the baptist whom we call na yahya do, 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 yes. do you mind if i step in there real quick okay the prophets agree with us and the prophets agree with Jesus that Jesus is God, that within the one God, there is a multiplicity in his person. So let me let me show you. OK, the, go ahead. The scriptures believe that there is one God, but the prophets also believe that God had a son. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. No. Nope. Yeah. So let's let's look at two passages. Psalm chapter two. Psalm chapter two. Yes, yeah, Psalm two. So this is talking, Psalm two is David. It's in the Zabor. And so David is speaking about those who come against God and his Messiah. And he's telling the decree of the Messiah. Verse 7. The Messiah is speaking and says, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, so God said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask your of me, yes. and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Then... It says in verse 12, a warning comes from David. It says, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. 
Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So the prophets, David says, God has a son. And in order for you to be saved, you need to trust and believe in him. Amen. There's another passage that I want to take you to. Go to Proverbs. Proverbs? Yes, Proverbs. Chapter 30. Chapter 3. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. And uh, uh, verse 30. Four. Yeah. yeah 30. Uh, Proverbs chapter 30, verse chapter 4. 30, okay. Yeah. Chapter 30, verse 4. Verse 4. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so the pro the this is this is the wisdom of Solomon. And so Solomon asks, Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered up the wind in his fists? who has wrapped up the waters in a garment, who has established all the ends of the earth, what is his name and what is his son's name? Surely you know. So he says, who is God's name? The one who gathers the wind of his fist, who has ordained all the ends of the earth, and what is his son's name? name surely you know right sally do you know the son yeah, right so the prophets tell us that god has a son now i want to go to one last passage we're going to the prophet isaiah okay and this is where this is where all three persons of the trinity are stated Let's go to Isaiah, chapter 48. Chapter? 48. Okay, voice. 12, and we'll go down to verse 16. 16. Right. Okay, proceed. So verse 12 says, Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel who I called. I am he, I am the first and the last, my hand laid the foundations of the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. So who's speaking here in Isaiah? Listen to me, Jacob. Mm -hmm. And Israel, whom I call. So he Israel says, I call. Okay. yeah, the speaker says that he's the first and the last. He stretched out the heavens. So who is that? Who's speaking? Uh, this... Um... It's, it's, it is implying God is speaking here. Right. That's the implication, yeah? yeah? You're exactly right. God is speaking here. That's very good. He says, When I call to them, they stand forth together. Assemble all of you and listen. Who among them has declared these things? The Lord loves him. He shall perform his purpose in Babylon, and his arm shall be against the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken and called him. I have brought him, and he will prosper in his way. Now pay attention to verse 16. Draw near to me and hear this. From the beginning I have not spoken in secret. From the time it came to be, I have been there. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. So Yahweh is speaking, and he says that Yahweh has sent him, and he has sent him with Yahweh's spirit. So here we have Yahweh, we have Yahweh who sent him, and the spirit of Yahweh. So we have the sender, another one who is God, but is also sent, and we have the Spirit of God with him. Sully, that's the Trinity. That's what Jesus says. You, 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 you want to take him to reigning sulfur? Yes. Yeah, we're we, in heaven. Yeah, yeah we're on we, earth. Yeah, we'll go we'll go to Genesis Genesis 19. 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 Genesis 
Genesis 19. Yes. Genesis 19. This is where God is judging. God is judging Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? Let's write the specific verses because I think it's a very, very long chapter. Yeah, we'll, we'll go just straight to that passage, right? So here, verse 23, 23 and 24. Okay. This is when God destroys Sodom. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot escaped and came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah fire and sulfur from Yahweh in the heavens. So here we have one person who we saw in Genesis 18 is called God, but he's on earth raining fire and brimstone from somebody else who is named Yahweh in heaven. So there's two Yahwehs communicating with each other. There's two persons, but they're both given God's name. One in heaven and one on earth. Right? Yeah. So here, the the we see the prophets with one voice saying, yes, God is one. God is one. God is one. Because we believe that there is only one God. But we also believe that there is something more dynamic. That God is multiple persons. That that one God is not one person. Yahweh is Father, Son, and spirit amen and we saw that not only in jesus but the prophets okay uh yeah, so we don't over it, it, yeah and uh, i think this is a very very new knowledge to me and i'm real uh thankful for this yeah man. but uh i'm going to flip another question to you that is um if we literally do the uh comparison okay yeah uh i have two questions uh there'll be a, sequ a sequential questions one yeah. is if we do literally do the comparison uh, by, uh in the in the bible actually in the bible mm -hmm. uh it's where really... the prophets refer to god as god without these party uh three persons in one god and such and such and such and such things uh, well well, well hold on hold okay. on Sully. did we not just see that the opposite is true that they did refer to God? And yeah, yeah, they did. They did. They did. I saw cool. it. So my question was, um, so for example, if I may ask, uh, is there is anywhere in the Bible uh, during the time of, uh, let's say, Moses, where mm -hmm. Moses referred to God as in this nature? Like the yes. God is one person, uh, it's one God, but with three person. Yeah. Like God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Like, sure. do we get that? Do we get that sense? Uh, do we get that uh, unif uh, uniformity in the nature of God for well, why don't we show all him the prophets? He, let me help you this, yeah. Ali. When, when, when Moses spoke to, the, to God through the fire, if you read the verse, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses. Yep, Exodus 3. Exodus now, let's, three, four, and keep. If you want to read that for him, I don't have. A, I'm, I'm away from my. Yeah, computer. I, I got it. I got it. Uh, we'll look at it. We'll look at it together. We'll walk through it together. Exodus chapter three, beginning at verse one. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. Now, let me stop there. Sully, when you think angel, you're thinking being made of fire or being made of light, right? Like the Islamic yes, yes. angel. Take that image out of your mind because that's not what the Bible is talking about. The term angel there simply means messenger. 
right? It does, it's not describing the nature of this thing, what this thing is made up of, because we'll see that this angel, this thing called the angel is God, right? So we'll see, right. we'll look at verse two, we'll look at verse two and then go to verse three, right? Verse two, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning and yet was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw, so here, first it was the angel in the bush now the language changes and it's the lord in the bush yahweh in the bush when yahweh saw that he had turned aside to see god called to him out of the bush moses moses and he said here i am then he said do not come near take your sandals off your feet for the place upon which you stand is holy ground. Verse six, and he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So just let me, let me just recap for you there, Sally. The angel of the Lord appeared and spoke as God. If you can do me BD 3111, Genesis 3111, yeah, Genesis. Because now we'll 20. see who the angel of the Lord is, according again to Genesis. Because yeah. the angel of the Lord appeared and yet spoke as God, one with God. And, re and remember, we've been going through gen back and forth from Genesis and, and all the other prophets. Moses is the one who wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So Moses is telling us all of this. Moses is teaching this. So here in Genesis 31, verse 11, then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes and see that all the goats that made with the flock are striped and spotted and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban is done to you. I am the God of Bethel. I'm the God of the house of God, where you appointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now so arise and go out from this land and return to the land of your kindred. So the angel is saying that the God whom you made a vow to, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, the God of your fathers, that's me. But remember, he's the angel of the Lord, right? Right. Yes. And, and, and get this. In Genesis, in Genesis 48, I believe, this same Jacob prays to the angel. Right? Yeah. So yes. here, let's, let's look at what he says. Um, let me see. Uh, Guys, five more minutes. I'm, I'm past my bedtime for a long time now. My bad. <laughs> we'll, we'll make this quick. And he blessed, verse 15, Genesis 48, verse 15. And he blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all this day, my the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, May he bless the boys, and in them let my name be carried on, in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So here, this same angel that appeared to Moses, appeared to Abraham and Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob Bless, praise to the angel that he blesses the boys. So here Moses teaches that there is Yahweh, the angel of God, who is also Yahweh, 
and the Spirit of God who hovers over the face of the waters in Genesis. So Moses teaches the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. You asked for that, Sully, we gave it to you. The Old Testament proves clearly that Moses believed in the Trinity. Right. So, so again, so we see Moses teaches it, the prophets teach it, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob experienced it in their lives. Moses experienced it in his lives. Uh, the prophets taught it. Jesus taught it. The, the entire Old and New Testament is united on who God is. And then as a Muslim, Sally, you should say the Quran confirms it as well. Because the Quran talks about Allah, his word, and his spirit. His word is eternal meaning it always existed. And the word of Allah is Jesus. So you see, yep. Allah kind of understood, or Muhammad kind of understood what the Bible was saying, but he got it mixed up. But there's a confirmation in your Quran on the same Trinity, the Father, the Word, the Spirit, that we have in yeah. our Bible that we just showed you now, that's confirmed in your book. All we're saying is that if the, this is called the Quranic dilemma, if the Bible is true, the Quran is false. And if the Quran is telling you to go to a false Bible, then the Quran is false again. Either way, the Quran is false. That's a big dilemma that, bro. Can, that can I back you up with the verse from the Quran? So clearly this book so that you can understand it and see truth in it. Sorry, Babylon, you said something? D yeah, James, I I'll say, um, can I back you up with the verse in the Quran? So leave, brother. What James just said, that the Quran as a book is telling you the Bible is the word of God. Cool, no problem. The Bible reject the Quran. And if you go to the Quran, you Muslim believe it's a word of Allah, right? Yes, right. Quran chapter 81, 19, it says that the Quran is the word of Muhammad or the saying of Muhammad. It's not the word of Allah. Chapter also, Quran verse, which verse? 8119. Uh, chapter now, 8. Slowly. 81. 81. 81, okay. Mercy. 81, 19. Okay. It says this Quran is the saying, or some other translation says, the word of the noble prophet, which is Muhammad. And this is Allah talking. I don't believe that, but it's okay. Now, Sully, I want to keep it in the Bible with my brother as I kept it in the Bible. If we show you that first, how do you know how Muhammad died? Let's 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 just find out. Um, I, I yes. I've got like one minute before I need to leave, bro. Yeah, let's let's, let's focus on the reality of of what the of what the of what Jesus and the prophets just said. So yeah, I think that's good. We've seen from the whole thing that Jesus prophesies his death, burial, and resurrection, and, and it's fulfilled in the prophets. And then we see that the prophets and Jesus are all equal on the doctrine of God, that the, that the Trinity is both in the Old and the New Testaments. So, so, Sully, I don't want to ask you to make a decision right now. I don't want to do that, and I'm not going to do that. But what I am going to ask you to do is that I want you to meditate on what we've learned today. We've learned that you can trust the New Testament. We've learned that you can trust the Old Testament and that the Old and the New Testament are equal, are, 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 are preaching the same thing. Point and, Jesus. right, and that Muhammad doesn't. So Muhammad is in complete disagreement with what the prophets taught. And so I, I, I want you to, to meditate again on those pas passages in the New Testament where Jesus speaks. And I want you to think about your soul's salvation. Jesus says in John chapter 3, verse 16, that God loved the world, and specifically God loved you in such a way that he gave his only son, that if you believe in him, you will not perish, you will not face God's wrath, but instead have everlasting life. And Jesus himself offers 
that salvation to you. He says in Matthew chapter 11, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In Islam, you can't have certainty of your salvation. But Jesus says, if you believe in me, you can. He says in John chapter 14, and I'll leave you with this, John chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to a para place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. So Jesus promises that if you trust in him, he is making a home with his father in heaven for you. Mm -hmm. So that when you take your last breath, you will be with Jesus and he will be with you forever in peace. He promises that. And as we saw earlier, he sealed that promise with his own blood and with an empty tomb. That's a promise that you can tank, take to the bank. What I want you to do is look through these passages again. Yeah, read them again, Pray. brother. Reread yeah, them. I think I think it was a very very insightful discussion because uh, always when we try to do these type of things, it's always about uh, who is right, who is wrong. It is not about making a person understanding why do you believe in what you believe, and why shouldn't you believe in what you believe. So I think this was very very insightful, and uh, thank you uh, guys. I'm a Muslim by birth and i practice uh, my my religion very, uh, not a hundred percent but I, i'm trying my best but one of my key aspect in life is that to find am i in the correct uh, am i in the correct faith am i doing what i'm supposed to do here on earth so thank you guys this was very insightful Please and give me uh, a follow give black doctor a follow give babylon a follow come back yeah, Find, come back. Uh, you know, the questions that you want to ask, come back and ask, bro, because at least you're honest about your questions.